At Lafayette High School, Principal Paul Rice and Mia Angela Angel Poole, the Rams painted the No Place for Hate Pledge on their lower commons wall, hosted the BMX No Hate Tour assembly, and hosted an international Rep Your Roots Day to learn about different cultures. And finally, Warhill High School, Principal Michelle Newcomb, Mia Rachel Nelson. The Lions started the <clears throat> Dude Be Nice Club, hosted an Acts of Kindness themed talent show, and hosted the BMX No Hate Assembly, Tour Assembly. Congratulations to all our schools, and we know you will continue this important work with our students and staff this year. Madam Chair, that concludes our recognition for this evening. All right. Congratulations to all of our to all of our sixteen schools. Um, we'll now move on to public comment, and I will once again turn it over to Mrs. Donnerich. It is at this point in our meeting where citizens are invited to address the board. <laughs> Those citizens desiring to speak have submitted speaker cards to the clerk prior to the start of tonight's meeting. These speakers are asked to come to the podium when their names are called, state their names for the record, and direct their comments to the chair of the board. It is the board's interest and desire that all comments are heard and respected. Hence, the citizens are asked to not engage in applauding, verbal outbursts, or any other type of demonstrations during the presentations. Personnel matters are not considered in public meetings, therefore the board requests that all speakers refrain from making reference to specific individuals in any form or fashion. Though the board does not respond to your comments, your comments are heard and appreciated. Each speaker is allocated two minutes to make their presentation, and the board asks that you respect this time limitation. Also, please be reminded that no time may be yielded to another speaker. Your acceptance and adherence to these guidelines will be greatly appreciated. Thank you, Madam Chair. My directions are concluded. Thank you, Mrs. Donner. And we do have a, a little stack of uh, cards tonight, so the, the time limit will be strictly enforced across the board. And I will call three at a time so that we can um, have everyone be able to get to the podium expeditiously. I the oh, thank you. <laughs> Our first speaker will be Marco Sardi followed by Aileen Parham and Andrew Kaysen. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the board, and Dr. Heron. My name is Marco Sardi, and I'm a teacher here at James Blair Middle School and president of WJCEA. Behind me are some of the community members, parents, organizers, and staff members who are here to show support for collective bargaining. The time to make a better future for our community is here. For decades, we have been asking, advocating, and rallying around crafting a work environment that values the needs of employees. You now have the power to put on paper how to make that a reality, and the future we can build for our schools collaboratively. Just this past spring, we came within hours of a bus driver protest, thankfully, Due to the trust those drivers have placed in their union representative to make the seriousness of that situation heard, we avoided a massive situation. A pay bonus was approved and the issue has been bandaged. Had my team not been thinking about students first, only what was best for showing the value of employee representation, that could have gone very differently. But we do not believe in bringing any bad faith arguments to the table. I hear often that we do not need collective bargaining since the problems could be solved already, but we have been waiting long enough and these problems have remained. You would not be the first school board to ask for input or to seek it for, from a local education association. Alexandria, Arlington, Montgomery County, Prince William, and Richmond have all sought input from their locals. Albemarle, Charlottesville, Fairfax, Falls Church, Harrisonburg, and Loudoun County have all created joint committees to create a bargaining resolution that blends employee input. If you wish to claim to value our feedback and to listen to the problems that we have, I implore you, use your actions and stand by those words. 
We have done the work needed to make this process as open and constructive for you as possible. And I now leave the task of giving us a seat at the table. Thank you, Mr. Barney. Hey, Lynn Parham. Good evening, members of the board, Dr. Heron and Chairwoman Artigo. My name is Alyn Parm. I am an employee of WJCC and a member of WJCA. And I am here to speak in support of collective bargaining in WJCC. Through collective bargaining, educators are empowered as professionals to have input on teaching conditions, career compensation, and educational practices. But not just educators, also education support professionals and employees in WJCC. Collective bargaining isn't just about salary, it includes working conditions, work assignments, it can also include workload as well. So I ask you today to support us as we've worked very hard throughout this campaign. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Parr. Uh, Andrew Kaysen, who will be followed by Virginia Maines, Chuck Colgrove, and Stephen Maines. Hello, Andy Kaysen. I'm a teacher on Lafayette, uh, excuse me, Jamestown. My <laughs> brain is a bit scrambled today uh, because uh, I just came back from open house. Um, I, uh, I wanted to start off talking to you guys with a quote from the Vice President. He didn't just fall out of the coconut tree. I think I'm paraphrasing that. Um, because when you look at the uh, large history of the ban on collective bargaining, um, when you go back to 1946, when uh, black hospital workers were organizing to move from a 12-hour shift to an 8-hour shift and things like that, that same year, uh, the General Assembly, in response, banned collective bargaining. Uh, for state employees and then subsequently banned it across from municipalities. So when you look at the large arc of history, you collective bargaining bans have been a way to keep uh, people who are just working people down. So you can be a part of that healing. Uh, a lot of other localities have chosen to be a part of that and include their workers in negotiating the terms of their employment. Um, I think it's a pretty simple option in the private sector. We have lots of different um, opportunities to negotiate for, for not only pay, but the conditions under which you work. Um, no shade thrown at, doc, uh, at, at our superintendent, but superintendents in Virginia can negotiate their pay. Uh, why not teachers? Why not support staff? Um, and so, when we look at that large perspective, I implore you guys to be on the right side of history and give us the dignity and the agency to have a seat at the table. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kaysen. Virginia Maines. Fifty years ago, I got the absolute wonderful job, most wonderful job in the world, and I was thrilled to be teaching seventh graders, non-readers. When I got my first paycheck, I was shocked. There was a deduction there for, for uh, a union dues. And I went to the principal and I said, I didn't join the union. He said, oh yes, you joined the union. It's non-negotiable. So uh, I was not very happy. And so the union rep said, well, you can uh, donate part of that to a, to a charity of your choice. I said, my church. Samaritan's Curse, Salvation Army. And he said, no, 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 no. You can't donate to faith-based. They recommended the Red Cross or uh, United Way. Both of them had such high administrative costs that I said, forget it. I don't want to donate any of them. 15 years later, the state became a right to work state. And I said, hallelujah, I can get out of the union. They said, you have to submit your forms. I did. They said, but you cannot get, you'll get, you still have to pay your dues, but you can get back what we would use for political action. Fine. I got a check for $25. At that point, now remember, this is 35 years ago, I was paying $40 a month in dues, $400 a year. So. I had the choice between $400 a year to belong to the union 
or $375 a year to not belong to the union. Somehow, I, I think maybe I could have handled my money better than they did. And if you think that the union is your friend, get it. There's always something else that comes up that, well, we need a little more, a little more, a little more. Thank you, Mrs. Mix. Uh The next speaker is Chuck Cobra. Good evening. Uh, before I get to my main point, I haven't asked of you. Uh, I like the student first idea we heard a little while ago, and I think everybody in the room agrees. All right. So if you all have heard maybe in your closing remarks, you can tell us about any evidence you've come across <clears throat> excuse me, that supports the unions actually improving like test scores, concrete evidence that students are better at students first. So my main point tonight actually deals with the conflict of interest. You know, unions, as we all know, collect dues from members. Some of those dues, or at least in part, are used to fund uh, campaigns uh, for people running for, for office, including you know, positions on this board, uh, positions on the city council would be included in that, as well as board of supervisors. Those last two, <clears throat> excuse me, those last two uh, fund the school division, right? They allocate funds to the school division. City council also appoints two members of, of this particular board. Um, so a major union function uh, happens to be negotiating, as we've already uh, heard so far, uh, contracts, salaries, benefits, etc. That puts the position of the union negotiating with people whose campaigns and positions, if they won those, won those races, uh, negotiating with those folks across the table for those salaries, benefits, etc. So uh, while I'm sure you know, many of you will say that, that you, can, you can remain you know, perfectly neutral in those negotiations. Can you say that for people who follow you and those other two boards that aren't represented here tonight and, and are involved in this discussion of whether or not to unionize? So for that reason, uh, I would I would urge the board to vote no against that unionization. Thank you, Mr. Colbert. Our next speaker is Stephen Maines, followed by Mark Lassiter, John Curran, and Mike Joseph. Good evening, Stephen Maines, James City County. I, I support unions, but like FDR, I oppose unions in the public sector. I specifically oppose teachers' unions due to the growing body of evidence suggesting they are detrimental to our students. First, teacher unions prevent accountability. The, a, a study by the National Bureau of Economic Research found that stronger unionization results in lower student achievement, particularly in math and reading. This is because unions frequently oppose standardized testing and performance-based evaluations, which are critical tools for identifying poor teachers. Secondly, teachers' unions protect teachers who aren't adequately teaching our children. We saw in 2020 the results of a public sector union protecting an underperforming employee. Policeman Derek Chauvin had a dozen or more infractions before he ran across George Floyd on that warm spring morning, but his union protected him in each case. Maybe the outcome would have been different had the union been interested in having the best police instead of protecting bad cops. A Harvard study uh, shows that uh, firing an ineffective unionized teacher can take years, cost tens of thousands of dollars, harming students and burning school money and administrator time that could be spent educating students. Finally, teacher unions often oppose beneficial innovation. For example, unions consistently fight against school choice which has been shown in various studies to improve educational outcomes, especially for low-income and minority students. By blocking these alternatives, unions limit student and family opportunities. While teacher unions purport to protect educators, their resistance to accountability, protection of the indefensible, and opposition to reform have significant negative student outcomes. They also harm the reputation and working conditions of our many good teachers. Say no to a teacher equivalent of Derek Chauvin, Put the needs of WJCC students above the rest uh, and say no to teachers' unions. I'll leave my comments with our citations with the secretary. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Mays. Our next speaker is Mark Lassiter. Uh, yes, a sir. reminder, there's, there's no uh, applause, please. Is that Mary Lassiter? Yes. My name is Mary Lassiter, and I'm a member of Campaign for Honorable and Inclusive School Names. It is my desire that James Blair Middle School be renamed. I'm suggesting James B. Tab Middle. I attended James Blair and graduated in 1969 as a member of the first fully integrated class. Reverend Tab was president of the NAACP 
1964, he had worked with Dr. Martin Luther King to bring about integration in the area. Reverend Tad sent his two older children to integrate Williamsburg Dancing County Schools. Maria went to Blair and Sylvia went to Massey Wales. This was a brave move as there were only two other black students that started with Maria. In 1996, the Virginia General Assembly passed House Joint Resolution 372 to honor Reverend Tad. He was known as a dean of preachers for the Williamsburg area and was a well-known community activist. I will read some excerpts from a newspaper article entitled Slavery, Salvation, Modern Congregation, and this is from the Virginia Pilot, August 2020. O said James Blair, an Anglican minister and co-founder William and Mary, introduced the idea of slave owning to colleges and churches. Blair arrived in Virginia in 1865, in, uh, sorry, in 1885. Blair, uh, Blair suggested that parishes buy slaves to entice experienced ministers from England to settle in Virginia. The enslaved were included with the belief, the land, and the home used by the minister. Children owned by the church were twice as likely to die. Thank you, Ms. Lawson. Thank you. Our next speaker is John Curran. Good evening. I don't think there is an individual in this room that would stop the teacher from making any additional money. I don't think that's the point. I don't think that's the outcome. What we're dealing with is we have limited budgets, limited amounts of money we have to work with. And when you look at the school districts that have gone utilized and had collective bargaining, they all end up in the same consequences, where they do pull money, they increase wages, that money comes from other aspects of the school systems usually affecting education. If you want to look, look at Richmond City Schools right now, they are not hiring teachers. They're getting around it by getting long-term substitutes, which they don't have to give benefits to, they don't have to give leave to, to save the money. This is affecting the teachers. Those teachers that want to come to work there are going to other districts like Chesterfield. That is not a collective bargain. I'm all for anybody sitting at a table and asking what they want. But the additional unexpected consequences that come from collective bargaining, including the overseeing of the union to management, limiting what principals, school boards, school administrators can do to teachers, take away the fiber of what we need to provide our children, and the children should come first. I think in the upfront, it all sounds great and rosy, but this really needs to look in. If you're concerned, if you look at Berkeley School of Education, they did a long report, 60 pages reviewing this and showing the collapse of school systems that actually went collective bargaining and how much it hurt the students itself as it basically only provided increased uh, salaries to long-term teachers who eventually retired and left the district. So I would appreciate it. Really take the time, dig into it, look at the systems that work. Thank you, Mr. Curtin. Oh, one second. Is there, is there a way to switch microphones out? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Switching that out. So, Mike Joseph is the next speaker, followed by Lori Cardenas, Susan Franz, and Marvin Franz. Is this better? Yes. Okay. Uh, yes, good evening. I'm Mike Joseph. I live in James City County. And I want to address the unionization of the WJCC school teachers. I am, I am not in favor of unionizing the Williamsburg James City County school teachers. The recent history of teacher unions have been promoting social agendas that which in some cases are considered divisive concept into the school systems throughout the nation. The Williamsburg James City Education Association is not just a small local union, but
but is affiliated with the statewide Virginia Education Association, which in turn is affiliated with the much larger National Education Association, which we know as NEA. The national teacher unions have become very political and will force through their organizational structure, their political or social agendas and indoctrination policies to our local school board. Their political agendas will not be necessarily coincident with our local value system, but will be leveraged on our school board's decision making. We do not want our local school boards to lose any of their authority or confusing academic issues with political issues. I do want our school board focused on academic performance. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Joseph. Our next speaker is Lori Cardenas. Good evening. My name is Laurie Cardenas, and I am a resident of James B. County for 20 years and also a speech language pathologist going into my 29th year in the schools. And I am here to ask you to please form a joint committee with us so we can help you save education here in Williamsburg. We have a lot of issues in our schools that we would like to talk to you about at a, pub, at a private table. So right now, if you guys decide to vote against us being part of the decision-making process, and only place that we can speak is right here, then we, the only thing I'll be able to do is come here every month and talk about things in public that should really be discussed more in private settings. So I'm just asking you to please really consider this. And it's not just about money. It's about manpower. It's about working conditions. It's about, it's about the kids and how we want to educate them. It's not, I can understand what other people are saying about unions and it's scary, but we haven't been allowed to have a voice for 50 years. And now we're allowed to speak and we want to help, and we want to have a voice. And there's over 800 of us that have signed and want to help. We want to have a voice, so please let us have a voice and let us help. That's all we really want to do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Our next speaker is Susan Fong. Good evening. I've been to many of these school board meetings listening to WGCEA ask for a seat at the table. The argument is often that the results of collective bargaining would ultimately benefit the students in their academic achievement. I would like to know how having a union will improve student achievement. I've read several studies on this topic. There are no definitive conclusions indicating teacher unions correlate with better student achievement. What I do find in these studies is that there is increased cost to the school system and the taxpayers without any benefit. One of many negative results of teachers' unions is that school systems are forced to retain underperforming teachers. Until an effective argument can be made that shows students achieve more when teachers have unions, I recommend that WJCC not allow teacher unions. After all, shouldn't this discussion be all about the students and how they do or do not perform? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hertz. Our next speaker is Marlon Trotz, followed by Andrea Claxton, Kevin Jean, and Elizabeth King. Yes, my name is Marlon Trotz. As a nuclear chemist, I was retired from sorry, nuclear power station. I'm familiar with how unions operate. My experience demonstrated that when union members were striking, the company had to bring in high-priced senior reactor operators with, uh, on their days off from the job. Uh, this resorted, resulted in a higher cost, which was then passed on to the consumer from the Dominion power. In a school setting, what will happen when teachers strike? How will services to the students continue? Who will pay the cost to make this happen? These are the situations that must be considered when deciding whether or not to allow teachers union. My experience shows that unions are not effective and increase costs, which we 
taxpayers will pay. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Kransky. Our next speaker is Andrea Claxton. Good evening. My name is Andrea Claxton. I'm a resident of James City County, where I pay taxes. I'm here to speak tonight in favor of collective bargaining. First, let me clarify that no one will be forced to join the WJCEA, even if we do achieve the ability to bargain collectively. There's a meme going around, though, that says, if you're in a profession that has an appreciation fee, you are underpaid. This is not about money or benefits, exactly. This is a question of trust and respect. I'm a graduate of WJCC schools. My kids graduated from WJCC schools, and now I teach in WJCC schools. I would guess that our excellent schools are the reason that the people in this room, or one of the reasons at least, that the people in this room choose to live in Williamsburg. You trust us to get your children safely to and from school. You trust us to provide that excellent education. You should trust us to be your bargaining partners. We have earned your trust and respect, and we look forward to you putting that trust and respect into action and passing collective bargaining. Thank you, Ms. Claxton. Our next speaker is Kevin Jett. Hello, I'm Kevin Jett, and uh, don't worry about it. Um, and so I'm a big believer in mutually beneficial uh, solutions to problems. Um, continuing education is one that I think can solve the, uh, the salary increase that the teachers are looking for. Um, continuing education can uh, benefit teachers long to become more effective while setting off the teachers to, or those, for those teachers who are longing to set an example lifelong learning for their students. So teachers already have a means by which they can increase their salary, as I understand. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that, that continuing education is paid for by the schools. Not about this one. But okay. Um, anyways, so that's all for that. And for the other for the other topics that they are looking to address, uh, I think that we can look for mutually Beneficial solutions to those as well. Thank you, Mr. Deed. Wait, wait, wait a minute. <laughs> Sorry about that. Everyone away. Everyone <laughs> Yes, sir, I'll take it. Thank you. Sorry about that. That's fine. If you want to send anything else that's not that you say, Did you guys hear me at all? Okay. Sorry, I have an implanted device right here. It kills my voice sometimes. Not, not you. One, there's going to be a little bit of static. The, yeah. the more we don't touch it, the better off we are at this point. Okay. Thank okay. you, Dr. Keever. Thank you all for your patience, and thank you to our um, IT and tech, tech experts that are working furiously back there. Now. All right, we'll proceed. Our next speaker is Elizabeth Kane, followed by Kara McLean, Jennifer Vico mendez and Amy Cork. Good evening, I'm Elizabeth Kane. I'm a retired WJCC teacher. I began teaching in 1978 and 
city public schools, um, teaching orchestra to the students there. I've enjoyed teaching over the years, and I've heard a lot of complaints, a lot of different issues, and a lot of solutions coming forward. Somehow, we never quite get to the root of the problem. It seems to me that often people come forward with solutions, and then we make a big sound about it, and then someone is sort of forced politically or some other way to just do something, and there we did something. But the same problem persists. And the problems really are lack of student academic achievement, lack of discipline in the classroom, lack of people listening to each other. And I don't think that just collective bargaining is going to just fix all that, like some magic thing, because it hasn't been passed in the systems that I've seen. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. King. Our next speaker is Karen McLean. Good evening. Um, the children in our community are precious to God and their parents, and you as school board are responsible to make good decisions on their behalf, decisions that will bless and benefit them. I am grateful for the time you spend at the schools and with the students and for the hard work you do. There are times when I feel my concerns and the concerns of other parents and citizens are heard, including last night. But there are times when concerns feel unheard and personally, partially, partially or fully ignored by the board or administration, like parents and citizens' concerns are put aside as not important or worth looking at. Often, decisions are made for us regarding the children without letting parents and concerned citizens know, and we are uh, given no say. In May, the school board wonderfully voted to keep nine and ten-year-old boys and girls separated to learn about their private body parts and functions, but before the vote even took place, somehow, even without complete board knowledge and no vote, a special recommendation was made. In both scenarios, it said, combining or keeping the kids separate, the whole curriculum will be taught that includes puberty and instruction for both biological sexes. Though this had not been the case, suddenly, with no vote and no clear knowledge that this was happening, it was decided fourth and fifth grade boys and girls will learn about the private body parts and functions of the opposite sex. Whether you know it or not, you have the last say on curriculum. But the children and parents of the children in the fourth and fifth grade, look at this again. Find out what parents think. Ask parents and citizens of this town if they want this. If they do not want their children learning about the opposite sex as private parts, and if they don't want their children, uh, please change. Oh, excuse me. Please change the decision back to girls and boys learning only about their own puberty and private parts at this young age. These are our children, not the schools. Pray the Lord. I am praying the Lord um, that help you to stand firm for what is right and will bless the children and for courage to remove curriculum and decision made in the past that are not in the best interest of the children. Thank you, Ms. McCoy. Our next speaker is Jennifer Vickham Mendez. Karen. Madam Chair and members of the school board, my name is Jennifer Vickham Mendez and I'm a resident of James City County. My two children attended WJC schools from kindergarten through 12th grade. My daughter is an Ivy League graduate. Both she and my son is pursuing a six, pretty successful career in music video animation um, and uh, attribute much of their success to teachers at WJCC whose mentorship and imaginative pedagogy gave them the tools they needed to thrive. For my son, band teachers like Mr. Jonathan Hargis, Mr. Francis, and the late Mr. Everett Collins were beacons of light and influence for him. In high school, Mr. Beard's approach to field biology, and in middle school, Ms. Rachel Moore, who's here tonight, um, passion for history captured his mind and imagination despite his inclination to avoid everything having to do with science or anything that wasn't music or the arts. For my daughter, Jennifer Marsana, in Spanish, Ms. Linda DeBerry, who walked on water in my house for over a year, as far as my daughter was concerned, are just two names that come to mind as educators who cultivated a love for learning in her. As an educator myself at William & Mary, I know that these teachers' professional um, experience 
position them to offer valuable expertise and wisdom to the administration of WJCC. Give them a seat at the table. Show budding teachers like those in my sociology classes at William and Mary who are considering teachers as a career that you value teachers and the teaching profession. The benefits to WJCC will come in the recruitment and the retention of the kind of teachers like the ones I mentioned. The kinds of teachers who shape the minds and lives of the young people of our community, our community's greatest treasure. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rickamendez. Our next speaker is Amy Cork, followed by John Slokovitz, um, Glenn Marshall, Chris Henderson, and Karen Rollins. Good evening, my name is Amy Quirk. I'm a member of the village and I have two children in the school division. Um, I want to start by saying thank you so much for the cell phone policy. I'm very excited about it and the really positive, refocused message that you all um, are starting school with. So thank you so much for that change. Um, and tonight, as uh, I want to talk about belonging, which I've talked about at other school board meetings. Um, and first I wanted to speak in support of the campaign to rename James Blair. Um, I think it really speaks to how we make schools that foster belonging. When I think of James Blair, I think of um, a figure that's divisive, the questions um, whether or not everyone belongs. Um, one of the alternatives that's being suggested is Reverend James B. Tabb. Um, he is a figure of unity. Um, he is a local leader that was recognized by, by the G Virginia General Assembly for his leadership and really trailblazing work um, during integration in Williamsburg. Um, as was mentioned by earlier speaker, president of the NAACP um, during integration, um, and see someone that fought to make WJCC schools a place where everyone did belong. Um, and I think that that's a really powerful um, way to signal um, belonging in our schools. Um, I also wanted to, I, I've been thinking about, you know, what makes our schools today feel like um, uh, they're welcoming for everyone. And when I think about that, I think about like the fourth grade um, team at Matthew Whaley and how they make history come alive in all of its complexity um, for, I know, for my children. Um, I think about uh, the cafeteria staff and Ms. Brown and how my kids say she makes the best chicken sandwiches. I should not even try to compete um, and make sure that our students are well fed um, and ready to learn. And I think about, you know, these are just like two small examples of, of the really important work that our staff and educators do um, to make students feel like they can belong and succeed and we should give them a voice. The next speaker is John Slotkovitz. Good evening. No one here is against teachers earning a respectable wage, but unionization is not the way. Unions do not promote hard work and integrity. I'm from New York, a very union prevalent state to say the least. I'd like to share two quick stories with you from my time there. First, when I was working in the plumbers union as a top level mechanic, I had a very competent, diligent, and responsible apprentice that I had trained up. He knew what I needed before I needed before I knew even to ask him for it, and we worked very well together. Well, once organizations invested in equity found out that our ratio of minority employers was unacceptable, the owners had to fire my apprentice and hire a brand new one who knew nothing of the trade, was very unorganized and lazy, as well as oftentimes was late for work. He was much younger than the man who had lived. He was a much younger man who lived at home with his mom, while my previous apprentice had a wife and small child, as well as mortgage payments to make. This is inevitably the direction all unions move, maneuver towards. My second story involves my uncle, who was director of purchasing of Welders Union. He had contract. They had contracted a job fixing an existing bridge that had fallen into disrepair in the Bronx. This, this contract became highly cont contested when the management firm hired Chinese welders instead of the unionized American welders. Well, to save everyone the joy of me explaining this long, drawn-out arbitration, the final verdict was that the Chinese welders would continue to weld the joints on the bridge while the American unionized welders received their full pay to stay on site and observe the Chinese welder welders. This sounds idiotic, paying two different crews to do the same job instead of just one. But the city could not legally fire the unionized welders and the speed and attention to the detail that the Chinese showed actually saved the city money. The committee hired to analyze the discrepancies found that unionized welders worked so slow and inefficiently that it would cost more money in the long run for the city to hire just them. These are just two of hundreds of stories. They're not the worst two, 
They're just a standard to. And this is what we have to look forward to the teachers once we allow the union to take over. But if the teachers are doing this, what can we expect Thank from you, the Mr. children? Sorkowitz. Our next speaker is Glenn Marshall. Good evening, board members. I'm Dr. Heron. Um, I'm Glenn Marshall. I retired from Newport News Shipbuilding. And we really want to hire and recruit a lot of your students. I'm a volunteer for the Association for Manufacturing Experts. I serve on the New Horizons and WJCC Center uh, Career Ready Advisory Committee. My goal is to share with you a benchmarking report called Graduating Career Ready Citizens with Employable Skills, which is a product of inputs from citizens and, and people in the organization. In organization. We are leaving a draft copy with you tonight, a work in process for your consideration and mostly important, your feedback on next steps. Every community should have a mission to ensure every student is learning at an early age and can demonstrate the use of basic foundational skills, reading, writing, math, and science before they leave first grade. Beginning in fourth grade, students should be learning about career and technical education, CT subjects and projects. All students should learn and demonstrate employability skills to take advantage of all the new college professional career choices they have at graduation. A public awareness campaign is needed to engage the entire community in a cradle to career strategic planning is much like manufacturing and trade state, but much bigger. At an early age, students should be learning and demonstrating and graduating as skilled career and college ready citizens with businesses providing real work experience in conjunction with the Virginia CTE high quality work based learning initiative. This is a draft designed as a starting point for a thoughtful discussion about how to best prepare and graduate skilled and career ready. Thank you, Mr. Students. Marshall. Thank you. Our next speaker is Chris Henderson. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the board, Dr. Heron, Chris Henderson, I'm a James City County a resident and taxpayer. As the public school system, the board public is the most important. The system is owned and operated by the citizens and the taxpayers for the benefit of the children who reside here in our community. As a public entity, we ultimately have the responsibility as a school system of creating productive citizens. And I cannot find a single example where a union has been introduced into a school system where costs have gone down and performance has gone up. Those are the metrics on which this proposal should be judged, and it fails. So I would encourage you to deny uh, the motion and create an alternative system that allows our valued educators to have input into the administrative process uh, of the school system so that their voices can be appropriately heard, either through some faculty council, as the university communities do, or some sort of faculty uh, uh, arm uh, that provides guidance to the administrative body. Uh, empowering a union will usurp the authority that's been granted to you by the voters. And as a voter, I object to that. And I thank you. Thank you, Mr. Henderson. And our final speaker is Karen Rollins. Board and thank you for what you do. If the WJCC Education Association wants to have a seat at the table with the WJCC School Board, it needs to try to get one of its members elected or appointed to the school board when the opportunity occurs. That said, I am sure the current school board welcomes input from teachers, parents, community members, Therefore, the WJCC Education Association can submit its views to the board like anyone else. We need our school board to focus on ensuring all our students get the best education possible. 
Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rollins. And that concludes our public comment for this evening. Thank you all for coming out and letting us know what you think. We will now move on to uh, our consent agenda, approval of our consent agenda, uh, which includes uh, four items tonight. I'll read them quickly. Sorry. Item 7.01, approval of financial report and monthly bills and payroll, July 2024. Item 7.02, approval of minutes from the meeting on uh, August 6, 24. Item 7.03, approval of resolution R1624, uh, National Hispanic Heritage Month. And item 7.04, approval of release from compulsory attendance cases, number R2425-01 number R2425-02, number R2425-03, and number R2425-04. Can I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? Madam Chair, I move to approve the consent agenda as presented. Thank you, Mrs. Hundley. Is there a second? Thank you, Mr. Riffle. Ms. Oller? Mrs. Hundley. Aye. Mr. Riffle. Aye. Dr. Cavazos. Aye. Ms. Chen. Mrs. Donner. Aye. Mrs. Ortega. Aye. And now we move on to our um, individual action items. Uh, item 8.01, approval of personnel actions. Is there a motion? Madam Chair, I move to approve personnel actions as presented. Thank you, Mr. Riffle. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Mrs. Donner. So. Mr. Riffle. Aye. Dr. Cavazos. Aye. Ms. Chen. Aye. Mrs. Donner. Aye. Mrs. Hunley. Aye. Mrs. Ortigo. Aye. Item 8.02, approval of fiscal year 2026 budget calendar. Is there a motion? Madam yeah. Chair, I move to approve the fiscal year 2026 budget calendar as presented. Thank you, Ms. Chen. Is there a second? Second. second. Thank you, Mrs. Hunley. Is there any discussion on this? Calendar. <laughs> All right, Ms. Oller. Ms. Chen. Aye. Mrs. Donner. Aye. Mrs. Hunley. Aye. Mr. Riffle. Aye. Dr. Cavazos. Aye. Mrs. Ortigo. Aye. Item 8.03, approval of authorization to permit county, uh, city county use of school buses. Is there a motion? Madam Chair, I move to approve authorization to permit city slash county use of school buses. Thank you, Mr. Riffle. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Mrs. Donner. Ms. Oller. Mr. Riffle. Aye. Dr. Cavazos. Mm -hmm. Aye. Ms. Chen. Aye. Mrs. Donner. Aye. Mrs. Hundley. Aye. Mrs. Ortigo. Aye. 8.04, approval of award of contract for request for proposal number 20241210, construction management services for two pre-K centers. Is there a motion? I move to approve the award contract for request for proposal uh, number 20241210, Construction Management Services for two pre-K centers to Madonna Boyard Peck and Vicky King for a total cost of $554,360. Thank you, Ms. Chen. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Riffle. Ms. Oller. Ms. Chen. Aye. Mrs. Donner. Aye. Mrs. Hunley. Aye. Mr. Riffle. Aye. Dr. Cabasas. Aye. Mrs. Ortega. Aye. And finally, uh, 8.05, approval of revisions to policy JFC student conduct. Is there a motion? Uh, Madam Chair, I move to approve the revisions to policy JFC student conduct as presented. Thank you, Mr. Riffle. Is there a second? A second. second. Thank you, Mrs. Hundley. Is there any discussion? Can I ask uh, for the, the steps to be reviewed one more time? I, I just want people to be able to catch it in both meetings. Mr. Riffle, the steps for disciplinary action. Disciplinary yeah, action. Do Dr. Bright, if you would please respond. Thank you. Sure. Um, and let me bring up the language here. So the first offense is a verbal warning to the student 
First of all, this is regarding cell phone use, right? Yes, ma'am. Okay. I, don't, I don't think that was sorry. clear. Sorry. You didn't right. have it in front of you, so I'm sorry. Go ahead. So this is specific to, to cell phone use. So during the instructional day, if a student has their phone powered on and out, um, a referral will be submitted. Uh, the parent or guardian is contacted. Uh, the phone will be confiscated and returned to the student at the end of the day. A second offense is that the uh, parent or guardian be contacted, the phone is confiscated, and that the um, parent must come pick up that device. The third offense is that the phone will be confiscated. Moving forward, uh, there will be a, a parent meeting to talk through uh, the repeat offenses, and at the beginning of the day, the student will turn in the device to an, an administrator or a designee, and they will retrieve it at the end of the end of the instructional day. If that continues and there's a fourth offense, the student will not be allowed to or permitted to bring their phone or personal device in for the remainder of the semester. Thank you, Dr. Brown. Does that answer your question, Mr. Ripple? Nice, yeah. Um, I was like a follow-up question, if I could make. Um, we had a question from Dr. Glossos last meeting about how we'll maybe get this message to our parents and students. Um, is there some type of agreement we're doing? Is it like in the policy for devices? And sort of make a clarification to the public on that. I think there was a change in policy, plus we've had a, a, a very robust communications plan as well. If you want to just outline some of the, the details of that for Mr. Ripple to, to really make sure parents are aware of what's coming and uh, engage their support with us. Sure, thank you. So following last school board meeting, an email was sent from Dr. Heron to all families indicating that this discussion was taking place and the context of the, the conversation. We launched a website that centered around Find Your Focus, not only explaining what the policy change would be, but the benefits to students for um, their academic well-being, their mental health, their physical health, all the things that they can really engage in when they have distractions put to the side. Um, we've come back to that, that Find Your Focus campaign through emails and newsletters, and we'll be continuing to share that message at the division level and at the school levels to ensure that really anything that's being sent out is containing that message. So, so hopefully you're not turning anywhere without being able to see that uh, posters in the schools as we welcome folks to open houses uh, that'll be blanketed everywhere. Thank you, Ms. Wall. Does that answer your question? I think so. I just more wanted to be, uh, I, I think, when I was in school, and some community members have mentioned this to me, once in the grocery store, and then yesterday when we had our town hall thing, um, that's some type of agreement that we do with devices, just so like there is that kind of expectation from both sides. Like we are involving parents in some type of policy here, and we are involving students in the day. I just think I want to describe. I think we do have something like this. I just want to talk mm -hmm. to it. Um, I think I think in general, um, every parent receives the code of conduct and signs off on that code of conduct, and so that is that agreement with the parent regarding this this policy. Great. Yeah. I just want to explain it to the public, so I, I'm very aware. I just wanted to mention one more time that how we're doing it in our division. So, so thank you for indulging those questions. Thank you. Yes, and the main the main change, if you're if you have not heard, if you have not um, been aware that. Uh, all grades now, this will mostly affect, this will mostly be a change for high school um, because K through eight was already, uh, the, was already the rule that, that personal devices had to be shut off um, during the day. Um, however, now it, all grades through 12th grade, um, cell phones will have to be shut off, um, not just put on silent, but shut off before entering a building and they cannot be turned on uh, until the student has left the building uh, for the day. So that is going to be a change and it's going to require um, our whole school community, including parents, um, to make some adjustments then. Uh, but we feel strongly that this is going to help students focus. Um, students won't be missing out on anything because all their friends will not have their cell phones either. So uh, this might actually, I think, be hopefully a relief and uh, allow students to focus on what's happening in the classroom and not what's happening out in their in their world. So that is the that is that is what we're referring to with the change to the student code of conduct right now. Alright, so we have a motion on the table. Is there any further discussion or any further questions? Mr. Riffle. Aye. Dr. Cavazos. Aye. Ms. Chen. Aye. Mrs. Donner. Aye. 
Mrs. Hunley. Aye. Mrs. Ortigo. Aye. All right. With that, we are coming to the end, but we'll move on to board member comments. Can I begin with you, Mr. Ripple? Yes, Madam Chair. Um, well, thank you all for coming to the meeting today. Um, I know advocacy is one of the things that we, we really look forward to here on the dais. Um, and I'm, 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 I think we're all taking it in and really trying to hear from our community, from both our staff and from our taxpayers. And, um, we understand it's a privilege to be on the board. So, so thank you for all the words today. Um, I got to attend the new teacher launch with uh, Ms. Huntley and our um, central office staff. And, and that was a pretty cool experience. Um, for just me as a new board member and for somebody who um, has never really seen something like that, I, and my older brother's a teacher and he, he talked about his experience and um, it, 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 was, it really seemed like a place where you could really become a family and we could do some type of work together um, with Dr. Kiever, you know, tell him jokes on stage and make people do some fun activities to really get to know your own people in your own building. Because um, I felt that when I kind of entered into groups for that activity and it was like, who is this guy? He's not. He's on a Matilka staff, or he's not. You know, it felt a little different, and I was okay, like recognized and doing that stuff. So I, I really appreciate that experience, and I just want to say thank you to um, the staff who put that on, and, and I hope that everyone's excited for next week and for specifically Friday for convocation. I'm looking forward to, to celebrating with our staff and getting ready for Monday, uh, which will now be cell phone free. I'm very excited to do that, and I think as the, the chair stated. This is really going to take all of us. It's going to take um, all of us to remember that this is going to be a little tough at the beginning. Um, there's going to be some, you know, it's like pulling teeth a little bit. And I, yeah, I, I get stuck on my phone all the time. I have little apps that say like 15 minutes, please give me more, you know, and it's like, it's it's a little scary. I get it. And, and so we're going to be kind of fighting, kind of maybe a little bit of a losing battle in the beginning. Um, but I, would, I think it's going to get us to the results that like I think a lot of people talked about in public comment today is, is results for our students and for our community to achieve in ways that we have in the past um, and really engage back in education. So it's a great step for our board and, and I know that, um, that we did this in, in good faith and, and I'm happy we're doing it now. It's mid-year when we're worried about a lot of other things at the same time. So this is an exciting step for us. So, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ripple. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming out. Last night, Mr. Ripple and I participated in a com um, community conversation, which we had a really nice turnout, and it was very uh, intimate, safe space to talk about concerns. And we kind of explained what our role is as school board members, and um, a lot of the community did not know how we function, and they found the information very very informative, and they really would like us to try it again. And it wasn't something new. Um, uh, Mrs. Ortega and I had talked about doing it last year and it just never came to pass. So Mr. Riffle um, took the lead on um, the technology part, which was very helpful to me. And it's something we would like to do again and maybe switch up um, different board members uh, coupling together to do this. Uh, one thing that we did here, which was um, something that I had thought about, but um, I'm sure the school division is already on top of this, but a couple of parents said what kind of resources will be available to students who are addicted to their cell phones and may have some adverse reactions. And I mean, I see someone laughing in the audience, but um, I did see a, a child whose cell phone was re removed and they hyperventilated and fell out. And so it is a real thing. It sounds funny, but um, I'm hoping that we, uh, that guidance counselors or someone will have some tips to help students to, that may have an addiction and that may be hard for them because then that is a distraction for their learning if they're um, having issues with that. So these are the types of things that were very helpful for us to hear and anytime the community can see that, that we're working together as a team, it's a win-win it's on both sides. Um, so I'm looking forward to convocation as well. And um, just one thing from the launch I thought was really cute. Um, when the teachers had to describe how they, the t um, think about how you want your students to describe you by the end of the year. And um, one teacher said, built different. And I, I thought that was really unique because I have looked at some children sometimes and said, wow, they're built different. But to hear an adult say that, a built different. And I mean, that's the reality. I think we all are built different. But one thing that did come forth is we have more in common than we do different in differences. And those, I hope the teachers will take that card game that 
um, Mr. Kiever helped um, for the icebreakers, and, and the, they do that with some of their classroom students because it was very, very helpful in getting to know and building relationships with each other. That's my comments. Thank you, Mrs. Hundley. Dr. Cavazos? Um, thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, I'd like to say, uh, I give my congratulations to all of the Division 16 schools who were awarded the uh, no place for hate designation. I think the unanimity, the unanimity speaks volumes about the commitment of our community as a welcoming place to live. Separately, um, the introduction of the new love and no cell phone policy, we believe was expected to improve the learning environment in our classrooms. And uh, everybody would truly really appreciate everybody's cooperation in this endeavor. Um, my gratitude to the staff and, and the educators in preparation for the launch of the division's new reading program, Benchmark. Um, I personally feel strongly that it will definitely increase, increase, increase the uh, division's literacy rate. And then finally, um, the collective bargaining issue has seemingly stimulated many emotions. And I can state that the public comments tonight were beneficial to me. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kawazis. Ms. Chen? Um, I appreciated all the comments tonight and um, just encouragement and continue to, as a board, we really do um, want to hear from the public and I do appreciate the, the emails and the comments that are made um, that help us, give us perspective. Um, and uh, I often run the loop that's right around the school and I think it's reflective of everything that's happening in all 16 of our schools. It's just an exciting time. As a new board member, I'm excited to be um, here at the beginning of a new school year, and for all of us as a board together to kind of uh, be part of starting a new school year. Um, so just, I've noticed um, outside the school, they're like scrubbing down all of the cafeteria tables, and I'm sure they're doing all this work in maintenance and transportation is busy, and all the teachers. Today, when I walked by, the parking lot was completely full. I'm sure there's lots of professional development going on and um, getting the school prepared for all the students to come back for open house. So um, just um, very privileged to be able to witness all that and to be serving on the board with all of you. Thank you, Ms. Chen. Um, I echo what my colleagues have said, and I'll just add that I am excited to attend convocation on Friday and kick off the school year with all of our teachers. Uh, there was quite a buzz in my household yesterday when the letters came of what elementary school students or um, who their teachers are, so there's lots of excitement, I think, amongst the teachers as well as the students, and I just look forward to a wonderful school year. Thank you. So much. Thank you, Mrs. Donner. Um, I, too, uh, hope everyone had a, a fun and relaxing summer. I know this is an exciting time of year um, going back to school, and I know that there's a tremendous amount of work that occurs throughout the division to get everything, every single thing ready, as, as Ms. Chen was just talking about. Um, everything inside the school is cleaned and, and freshened up and ready, and um, just appreciate all that goes into starting once again. Um, I do, uh, I do support the cell phone policy. I am hopeful that uh, we won't have too many, too many hyperventilations. <laughs> but I do think that that it is a critical, a critical step, and I'm, I'm excited to um, see, you know, some improvement and that, that this uh, new policy will bring about. Um, and yeah, I just I'm looking forward to convocation and um, hearing a. Uh, our theme for the for the year that's that we'll, that we'll find out on Friday. Um, I do thank the public for coming out. We do value each and every person's um, opinion, and it helps us be informed and make decisions. And those of you who just came to listen and participate and inform yourselves, um, we appreciate you very much. We we need our whole community to work together and to communicate with each other to make this work. And so we we appreciate that very much. Um, with that, I will read upcoming events. Policy committee will meet tomorrow morning at 8.30 in room 203 at the school board and central office. Um, and WJCC convocation is this Friday, uh, August 23rd at 9 a.m. here in James Blair Middle School Library.
in our upcoming meetings. Um, we have another uh, school board retreat on 829, August 29th, 3.30 p.m. in room 300 in the annex. Um, we have a closed session on September 3rd, starting at 4 p.m. in room 300 of the annex, followed by a work session and action items also on September 3rd at 4.30, room 300. Um, and then closed session on September 17th will begin at 5.45 in room 300 of the annex, followed by the regular meeting on September 17th at 6.30 p.m. here at the James Blair Middle School Gymnasium. And with that, this meeting is adjourned.